Welcome to the Christian Woman Leadership Podcast, where we hope to inspire you to embrace your God-given gifts, skills, and passions in order to lead with confidence. We want you to remember that you are fearfully and wonderfully made in the image of God, and you are fully loved by Him. You have been designed on purpose by God with unique gifts and passions in order to love and lead those around you. I'm your host, Esther Littlefield, a pastor's wife, business owner, mom, and writer. And I'm Esther's co-host, Holly Kane. I'm a wife, mom, and business owner. I also write at hollycane.org, where I focus on my passion for women's ministry. Together, we chat about important issues that Christian women leaders face. In addition, we interview other women just like you who lead in various roles from church to community to business. Through this podcast, we offer you encouragement, tools, and resources to help you on your leadership journey. We are so glad you're here with us. Do you ever find yourself wondering how you can keep going at this pace? Have you struggled with feeling tired all the time, even though you're getting enough sleep at night? It might be that you're on the verge of burning out, or you simply might not be getting the right type of rest. Hey friend, I'm your host, Esther Littlefield, and today we're doing something a little bit different here on the podcast. I am sharing a replay of an episode that originally aired back in 2020. This is an episode that Holly and I have referenced many times, and we know that you might be listening today, and maybe you haven't actually listened to every episode we've ever released. So we're going to share this one today because it was such a great conversation about burnout, rest, and getting out of an urgency mindset. If you enjoy this conversation, I want to encourage you to check out Dr. Sandra Dalton-Smith's book, which we will link up in the show notes. This is such a powerful conversation. And even if you listened back in 2020, it's almost three years later. So why not take a listen again? Let's go ahead and dive into this conversation all about why leaders burn out and the seven types of rest we need. Well, welcome, Dr. Sandra, to the show. I'm so excited to have you here with us. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah. So as we get started, could you just tell us a little bit about what your life and leadership looks like right now? Right now, most of my leadership activities are in two places. One is just within my own body of believers. I spend a lot of time within my church kind of exhorting and helping people get to their next level with whatever God's doing in their life. I love helping people kind of see the possibilities. Right now is an excellent time because you know things are so different that I think the expectations have kind of been laid low and people right. are just open to whatever God's doing, whatever this new thing that's coming. And so I'm doing a lot of teaching, online teaching and courses at this point, helping um, women who feel like they have a message to share, mm-hmm. learn how to get that out into the public, whether that's through speaking and not just within Christian circles, because I'm a speaker and most of my mm-hmm. speaking is done within corporate settings using biblical principles. So I love that, helping yeah. people kind of see that that's possible to make right. a living actually from that. And also just within the writing and sharing their knowledge online, how to construct online education that they can share with other people, meeting needs and, and really identifying their own gifting mm-hmm. and how to be able to use that for God's glory. Awesome. That's great. So take us back in time and tell us a little bit about your leadership journey. How did you get to where you are now? Well, I'm a, I'm a board certified internal medicine physician. So most of my journey was spent in medicine and clinical medicine. Um, I grew up in a situation where I had a really just interesting concept of life and death. My mother died soon after childbirth. So I grew up without a mom. And it was one of those things that I think life and death was always kind of on the back of my mind because of that. And so I think it was very natural for me to be drawn towards medicine and the healthcare field. And I love it. I still love it. Yeah. I've always loved it. I can't remember wanting to be or do anything else. I recall as a child growing up with one of those little operation games, yeah. you <laughs> touch the sides and it starts buzzing. So I've always loved that aspect of it. So when I got into medicine, I went in it hardcore. I mean, I wanted to do everything. I was, I'm a type A personality, high achiever type personality. So, you know, I went, I went straight through high school, college, kind of in record time. Yeah. <laughs> 
to this end goal. And I think what for me, what I noticed in my journey is that because I was so goal oriented, I never really stopped to appreciate any of the accomplishments along the way. Everything was an ends to the means, you know, was to getting Mm -hmm. that MD behind my name. And so even once I had that, it was always trying to strive for something more. There was always a goal that I was going after. And eventually I burned out. I got to a point where I had a life that looked extremely successful on the outside. I was, you know, in international media, talking on different subjects as a subject expert. I had books that were traditionally published. I I had all these things that I said I had wanted, you know, the house, the kids, the husband, all of these things, and none of it satisfied. And I got to this point one day when I had picked up my kids from daycare and come home from my clinical practice of medicine. I put them in front of the TV and I remember just laying out on the floor and I laid there and I just thought, God, if this is all there is, if this is as good as it gets, I'm done. I don't want to do this anymore. Mm. And, you know, it was in that moment, I really just felt like God just not spoke to me audibly, but spoke to my heart in that, you know, this is the first time you've stopped it years. And it, that yeah. hit me <laughs> because yeah. it was like, you know, you're right. You know, this is the, I, I got to the end of myself and that was the first time that I actually stopped and had a conversation with him about how my life was going. I had plenty of conversations about, you know, bless this, you know, thank you for this, plenty of those conversations, but not God, what, what do I need to be doing? What is, what is my work for now? And what is work I'm just clinging to? Cause I like work. Mm. Yeah. I think a lot of our listeners could really relate to that because there's a lot of women who listen who are that high achiever. They're doing a lot. They're serving in so many different ways. They're, you know, excelling in their career. Uh, But like you said, a lot of leaders end up in this place of burnout. Why do you think that that so many leaders end up in that same place that you were at? Well, I know for myself, and I think for a lot of leaders, they do have that high achiever personality. Mm -hmm. They like goals. They like seeing Mm -hmm. a goal. They see what they want. They see what the goal. They are people who God have have made to mentally be very systematic in their approach at going after things. And that's what helps them be a leader. They're able to kind of see the big picture and see steps to get there. So they're able to to offer other people assistance on how to take similar steps to get there. And I think the problem with that is, for those who are kind of um, made that way, it's a little bit harder for us to step back and appreciate once we've accomplished something. Mm -hmm. So rather than actually taking a breath and saying, wow, you know, that was great and and enjoying the moment of accomplishing, we're always looking at for the next thing. So there's never any rest or restoration or reflection. And those were some of the words that God really just highlighted to me during that period is Mm -hmm. really to return to a place of rest and seeing how that helps restore me to be able to be a better leader and how reflection, taking time to look back is not kind of, um, we always say, don't look back, keep pushing forward, that kind of mentality. Mm -hmm. But in the reflecting is actually how we become stronger and see where we can actually improve. Mm, I love that. I love those those things you just mentioned. Uh, <clears throat> I think that those would be great practices for all of us to take to take on. So I'd love to hear how how you moved past that moment. So you realized you were at the end of yourself, at the end of your rope. What did you do? How did you recover from that place? Well, the first thing that I did was I knew something had to give. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what, but I knew some, that something had to change. And so that was the journey. My background has been in research, my majors in biochemistry. So my tendency when I look at problems and when I'm researching is I like to go to kind of the core, you know, with biochemistry, you're going to, to the molecules, you're going down to like the smallest area that you can get to something. And so that's what I wanted to do. I I really started initially looking at medicine and thinking, okay, if I'm tired all the time, there has to be a medical reason, right? I'm a doctor. So that's where my head went. (laughs) So, um, you know, I started doing all of the, I initially started with doing all this testing and stuff on myself and, and trying to get eight hours of sleep because honestly, I wasn't getting anywhere near that. Mm. So I tried to do all of these things that conventional medicine says, you know, if you do this, you should feel well rested. Well, none of that worked. 
Um, and so I was like, you know, it's either I'm broken or it's broken at this point. <laughs> and, and so I then started thinking, you know, because I felt like that moment on the floor was almost like a holy moment. It was like God was giving me this invitation to, to search out something that I didn't know. And so I then started going through the scripture and I went back to when rest is first you know, first discussed kind of the first initiation of even a conversation on rest, which, you know, as you know, is in the creation story. And I thought, and God really kept me in Genesis for over a year, kind of reading the entire book. And I really just didn't feel a release to move past that book. And it finally got to a point, I was like, God, I don't understand what I'm supposed to get from Genesis because I'm not seeing whatever it is that I'm missing. And so I went back to the creation story again after a time of prayer and fasting and just really feeling desperate, to be honest with you. And I, and I started looking at specifically the, the day before the day of rest and the day after kind of those chapters around the Bible, you know, in day six, animals are created followed by man's being created, mankind being created. And then on day seven, it says God rested. Well, it never had before, before I read it on that particular day, had it ever dawned on me, what is, what was man doing while God was resting? I'd never thought about it. Yeah. You know, I was like, <laughs> I've never okay, thought about that either. I read the story kind of with this, this kind of boxed in mindset. And I never thought about what was man doing because it doesn't actually talk about man working till the entire next chapter. You know, all of that's in chapter one. Then we go to chapter two. Then it talks about man working. I was like, God, have we completely missed the boat on this? Most of us, we work in an attempt to earn our rest. But your pattern that you showed is that you created, then you spoke into. You you let them know who they are, what their commissioning was, what their role was on the earth. You basically gave man its identity on day six. Yeah. And then the entire next day, their actually own their first full day on the earth was a day of rest, was a day of absorbing what you'd said, sitting in your presence, getting filled up to then go out and do the work. Mm. And it was almost like the Holy Spirit was like, ding, ding, ding. Now you get it. Yeah. That's the life you've been missing. Mm. Wow. I love that. So you, you went into this season of researching and studying God's word and really understanding, started to understand rest differently. Uh, so how, I, I'm curious what you did in terms of your work at that time. Did you make any logistical changes in like the amount of, of work you were doing? Or mm-hmm. I'm just wondering how your life looked differently aside from what you were kind of studying and learning at that time. Yeah. So my life looked, well, I had two toddlers at the time. So okay. it was you know, it was mommyville. So (laughs) as far as my clinical practice, the the clinical practice itself didn't change very much, Mm -hmm. but the extra work that I did changed because at that time I kind of stepped back from writing. I had written my first um, traditionally published book. And then I don't have another book that I wrote until like 2015. So there was like all of this extra stuff that I'd been doing, the speaking, the writing, you know, the media, there, there's a few years in there where it all went silent yeah. and it was by choice because it, it was just pulling me apart. It was just too much. So during that time, I spent a lot of time in God's word and I spent a lot of time kind of extrapolating what rest means, looking at the scripture, looking at the science, looking at the psychology aspect of it. And from that really pulled out seven different types of rest. That's when that occurred. Okay. So it wasn't like I had completely stopped working, I guess, so to speak. Right, right. But it was like I was working toward finding a solution mm, to what yeah. I needed to be able to to survive at that point. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that there's so many women in particular that I that I think of when they are um uh, in a place of either close to burnout or burnout where they feel like they don't have a choice. They have to keep going at the same pace. They have to keep, uh, you know, doing the same level of work to keep things afloat. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I guess I'm curious what you would say to a woman in that position where maybe she feels like she, you know, if you got kids, you got to keep caring for your kids. You know what I mean? (laughs) Uh, But it sounds like for you, you just cut away everything that was non-essential that you could. Yes. 
Yeah. I did at that time because I didn't know any other way to do it. Yeah. Honestly, now I don't do that. Now it's, uh, it's funny because people who look at my life, they're like, I don't know how you, you know, I don't know how you do all that you do and mm-hmm. still have joy and happiness and peace and still feel well rested. Yeah. That's what I, you know, at the time, my idea of what rest was, was cessation of activity. Rest was stopping. Mm. And so it was in the kind of the unpacking of what rest means that I found that I really got an understanding that rest is not about stopping. Stopping doesn't equal rest. Rest is about restoration. It's about reviving what's been depleted. And so that's what I had to get an understanding for. And so for any woman who feels that way, who feels like, well, I can't rest because I got all this stuff I'm doing. my, My challenge really is to understand where she's being depleted the most and being very intentional intentional about restoring the rest in that specific area of her depletion because that's when you start feeling feeling the change right. you know, if you're, if your deficit let's say you know, um, is in emotional rest then you can get all the sleep you want which is a type of physical rest yeah. you're still going to feel tired mm-hmm. because you're replacing rest that is not depleted but if you replace that emotional rest that you're needing, then you start feeling energized again. Yeah. So you don't have to stop all your activities to do that. Actually, the restoration part in most cases is an active work. It's just not a depleting work. It's a restorative work. Okay. I love that. So you've mentioned this this idea of seven types of rest. And I know that's what you have written about in your book. So I'd love to hear you share a little bit about these seven types because I think the women listening are like, tell me, tell me more about how I can like <laughs> restore in the right area. So tell us about these seven types of rest. Well, I'll, I'll mention all seven of them, just kind okay. of listing them. And then we can kind of dive in if there's any specific that are yeah. interesting. Do you? Sure. So the one everybody's familiar with is physical because the main type where we associate rest with is sleep. But even within physical rest, you have active and passive types. So sleeping and napping are both the passive types of physical rest. And then you have to keep in mind that there are active types of physical rest, which are mainly helping you kind of keep your muscles relaxed, keep your circulation Um, adequate, keeping your lymphatic system flowing properly. And those things include like massage therapy, um, stretching exercises, leisure walks, those things where you're not taxing the body, but you're allowing the body to come back to a place of kind of harmony and Mm. and, um, equilibrium. Okay. And then you have spiritual rest, which I think everybody on here is familiar with to some degree. But my, my thing that with spiritual rest, particularly with people who are in ministry, is that it's not about religion. It's, it's more about the relationship and just being very intentional about building that relationship aspect of your spirituality with God. Um, so the spiritual part is, for many people of faith, is one that they already practiced to some degree. Right. And most of that has to do with things with prayer, kind of the prayer where you're not asking for things, but you're listening. It's that exchange part of that relationship. Then uh, the next one that most people are familiar with is mental. Uh, Mental rest is uh, allowing yourself to get to that quiet headspace. It's when you're no longer checking off your to-do list in the middle of the night before you go to bed or <laughs> having that woulda, coulda, shoulda conversation that you you know wish you'd come up with the right words in the time, but now you're reliving the whole thing. So that's what mental unrest looks like. So mental rest is the opposite of that. When you're able to get your head to go to a quiet space and to clear your thought patterns and just to allow a, a clean slate in that area. Yeah. So those three are the most common that you're that many people have heard of. The four that people are less aware of are the emotional, social, sensory, and creative. With emotional rest being the rest that we receive when we are allowed to be fully authentic. It's when our we are unmasked in our um, relationships with others. When you're not putting on your professional persona if you're someone in leadership. So women who are in ministry, women who are CEOs and leaders of companies and small businesses have a tendency to have a deficit in emotional rest because as the leader, there's a level of um, inauthenticity that comes with being the professional. 
And let me give myself as an example. As an internal medicine physician, I'm in the ICU and the ERs quite a bit. So my normal personality is a bit of a jokester. I'm the person who's going to probably pull a prank on you if we're hanging out as friends. That's not going to fly in an ICU if I'm telling you that somebody is lying on the bed about to die. So I have to have, I have to kind of tame down my normal tendencies. And it's not that I'm trying to be fake, but it's just not appropriate. So there's a level of professionalism that causes me to be restrained. And it's that restraint that puts on kind of an emotional weight on you. Because for some people, they live under that level of feeling like they have to restrain their authenticity. And when you do that long enough, then the question comes, is my original design okay? Or is something critically wrong with me? Mm, And that's when we start getting things like depression and suicidal thoughts and unworthiness. And so that's what emotional rest looks like. Understanding you're okay. And, you know, you're, you're not going to fit into everybody's little night's neat bubble. But, you know, part of that leadership kind of puts a strain on that part of ourselves. Right. Then there's social rest. Social rest is the rest we receive around the presence of life-giving people. Now, I always tell people they need to identify who are the 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 draining and negative people in their life and who are the positive life-giving people. And when I say that, automatically people come, can come up with that person who kind of zaps the energy out of the room. But the, the thing is, the negative people in your life are probably the people you love the most. And so when <laughs> I say they're negative, I'm not saying that they're bad people. What I'm saying is they are negatively pulling on your social and emotional energy. So your, your kids, your spouse, your elderly parents, these are probably the negative people in your life that are pulling on your energy, which means you need to make sure that there are some people in your life who you like being around who being in their presence makes you feel edified and fulfilled, but they don't want anything from you. Mm. That's why adult relationships and friendships are so important and having things like life groups and places where you don't have to provide anything other than just be present and receive. I love that. That's that's so great. (laughs) And then the, the final two are sensory rest. Sensory rest has to do with just like it says, our senses. And so um, many of us live in sensory overloaded environments. If you're a mom with you know, with small kids at home, you're probably hearing high pitched screeching all day long. That's sensory. That'll lead to sensory overload. If you're someone who works on a computer for long hours a day, that can lead to sensory overload. The bright lights within. Um, office spaces or even within our homes, playing the TV all day on the background noise just to kind of (laughs) have it on just because, not because anyone's watching it. So we have to be mindful of how all of this excessive sensory inputs affecting us, uh, particularly with our many of us kind of living with our gadgets 24-7, having them at the dinner table and everywhere else. So sensory rest is allowing your senses to have some time with silence and darkness and just getting comfortable again shutting the noise out in our lives and making room for that. You know, if you're someone who's at work is very noisy or light, lots of bright lights and lots of activity going on at work, you know, rather than listening to, you know, talk radio on the way home, you may better serve your family and yourself by just driving in silence so that your your senses can diffuse a little bit before you walk through the door. Because what we're finding is a lot of people have road rage and a lot of these different anxious and anger issues because they're on constant sensory overload. Mm. And so the emotions respond to that by being agitated. Yeah. yeah. And then the final type of rest is one that most people have never heard of. It's called creative rest. And it's the rest that we receive when we allow ourselves to appreciate and be revived through beauty. So some people experience this when they go to like the beach, <clears throat> bodies of water, you know, they get around bodies of water and they just feel revived. They can't explain it, doesn't make sense to them. But you know, the, the, the interesting thing is that when I was doing the research, the science actually shows that there are some people who their brain chemistry actually activates and changes on MRI imaging when they look at bodies of waters or certain colors of teal and blues and greens, because it does have a physical effect on them. 
And so that's what creative rest is. It's that awe and wonder that we get when we allow beauty to create something inside of us. It's not taking an art class or writing poetry because that's actually creative work. You're okay. putting a demand on your creativity. Mm. This is allowing beauty to create inside of you to awaken and release something and revive something inside of you. So it can be man-made, like going to a museum and looking at art, listening to a symphony, listening to an orchestra, yeah. or it could be na- natural, God-made, like the ocean or the mountains or a flower or anything that really brightens you up from the inside out. Mm. That's so interesting. I think I'm one of those people because I I always say like going to the ocean is just my favorite thing in the world. I just (laughs) love it. And I feel differently when I, when I do that versus long periods of time of not being able to do that. So that's so cool. The the great thing about that is because I'm that way as well. The science showed that you didn't have to go to the setting to get the same benefit. Oh, So actually putting like pictures of the ocean on your wallpaper of your, or the, the, on your computer or your phone can have the same effect. And that's what the MRI showed. They didn't actually, they were looking at pictures of the ocean when their brains had that response. That is so interesting. It's so funny. I have a screensaver on my computer of my daughter by the ocean when we went to Florida last winter. So it's a constant reminder. (laughs) (laughs) So that's awesome. Okay. So I know you said maybe we can talk a little bit more in depth about a couple of these. And I have a couple of questions about um, a few of them. So I'm really interested in the emotional rest that you mentioned and particularly the idea of being able to, like you said, unmask that that kind of persona that a lot of us have to put on in our workplaces or in our leadership positions. What are some of the practical ways that we can do that? Do you have specific suggestions for how to experience that ability to unmask and and just uh, get that emotional rest? Yes. Well, I think, I think, honestly, I think Jesus did the best um, show and tell of how that should be walked out. Um, You know, when we look at his life, we see that he spent lots of time in leadership, you know, leading masses and, you know, thousands of thousands of people. And then we had uh, times when he had smaller groups that he was leading that were the 12. And then you saw times that he broke away with the three. And it was during those times where he broke away with the three that we see him show us how to do this. Because one of those times is on the Mount of Transfiguration, where we see, you know, at that moment, they got to see all of him in his fullness, kind of what I say in Mm -hmm. his full authenticity. Not that he was ever being inauthentic, but he did not reveal all of himself to everyone in the beginning. And so I think we all have to have a very similar thought process because there is nothing fake or phony about Jesus. And when I talk about this, some women automatically feel a little bit of a defense mechanism pop in because that word inauthenticity kind of has a negative connotation to it. But it's not that you're intentionally trying to deceive. It's that that is what is expected in the role. You are, you are functioning within a specific role. And so I think it's very important to look at that example and understand that it's okay when you're in your leadership position to lead and to be the leader, which means that you're not going to expect those you're leading to be the ones who are your social rest. You're not right. expecting them to pour into you. As the leader, you're pouring into them. But you need to have those three or two, or one. You Mm -hmm. need to have somebody who's pouring back into you. And that relationship needs to be just as important to you as those people that you are pouring into. Mm. Yeah. And how does vulnerability play a part in that? You know, it sounds like kind of what you're saying is you need to have somebody where you can be completely transparent and vulnerable with. Would you say that's true? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. That's that is the that's the, the those two or three people. <clears throat> excuse me. That's those two or three people who you really and honestly, for some of us, it's just one. Sometimes yeah. that you just have to find the one. But right. you need to have someone where you can openly share your emotions and kind of what's going on in your life and what you know and what you are feeling in the moment and allow them to speak back into you. And for some, that could be very difficult, kind of understanding how to do that. I know for me personally, that was a a huge part of my journey because I didn't have that. 
in medicine, right. you're, you're taught to suck it up and deal with it. <laughs> yeah. you know, there's no, no room for you having to kind of have these type of relationships that the time frame didn't allow itself for that. And what I ended up having to do was starting to seek out those people. So there is a time period there where I didn't have the three. I didn't have one to yeah. even do that with. And the, th- it, the thing is, it becomes difficult to do that with your spouse because as I stated, they're one of the people who's pulling on you. So then you get into this tug of war with that. <laughs> you know, and a right. lot of couples are, do that. They're each other's kind of social or emotional rest, both. And yeah. so they, and you should be, that's part of marriage. There should be that. But there needs to be someone outside of your marriage as well that you feel comfortable sharing that with. Because otherwise, you never feel like you have someone that you can just be filled with and not have to kind of pour and receive and pour and receive and go back and forth. Yeah. Um, What I ended up having to do was my two closest friends, and it was built over a course of years. These two closest friends, I met them at a conference. We really kicked it off. And I know for most of us, if we meet someone that we really have a good relationship with and they're kind of across the country, you just kind of like, oh, well, that was cool. And, you know, never see them again. Yeah. Well, uh, all three of us, it's almost as if God was like, all three of you are hungry for the same thing. Try to work it out. Because we had this prayer time together at this, this writer's conference. And they had us group up in sets of three, and we happened to be the three together. And at the end of this this time of prayer, um, you know, we didn't know each other before this. We all got up and we were about to leave. And one brave soul, one of the three of us turned around and she was just tears running down her face. She goes, I can't do this without you guys. And we were just mm-hmm. like, <laughs> because no. we were all feeling the same thing. Yeah, Nobody right. was brave enough to say it. And so she said, I can't do this. She goes, I came here praying for God for, for, for a sisterhood. I needed somebody to do this with me. We had all released books. We were all kind of in this fresh journey with God, not really knowing how to even navigate. And so it was during that time that we came up with the plan. Now, I was on the East Coast. One was on the West Coast and the other one was in Canada. So we weren't <laughs> going to be able to get together. <laughs> you right. Know, <laughs> So it was around that time where Skype was still available. I don't even know if Zoom was a thing, right. but Skype was a thing, at least at that time. So we agreed that once a month we were going to meet on Skype so that we could see each other and yeah. smile and look at each other and, you know, have this relationship. It's yeah. now been almost almost eight years, actually over eight years <laughs> that we've been doing this and having this relationship where every month we meet. And that's what I try to get people to understand this this social rest and emotional rest can be done virtually. What yeah. the science showed was that with social rest, that these life-giving people, you just need to be able to, to experience their presence. So being able to see them online, being able to see their interaction, kind of have it be real time. We've had between us over the past eight years, we've had deaths that we've navigated together. Mm-hmm. One, one of them lost their husband tragically. And mm-hmm. we've navigated that together, both in person and online. Right. So we, we built a friendship that came from a three-day conference conversation that has lasted over eight years with monthly contact. And every single year we make a point of getting together for a conference. Mm. I love that so much. And it makes me think of another episode that we've done on friendship. Um, I had a guest, Noelle Rhodes, and she talked about friendship and she talked about that. Like sometimes it is going to be a virtual or a long distance relationship because for a lot of of our listeners, if they are in ministry leadership in particular, they Mm -hmm. find it difficult to find those life-giving relationships within their local circle. Because again, if they're in the leadership position over, you know, the women in their church, Mm -hmm. it's, it's tough to have that relationship with someone that you're leading. Right. And so a lot of times we have to go outside of that circle. And sometimes that means it it needs to be long distance, but that's just such a great example of that. It can be done. (laughs) So, and I think it's important for, for um, particularly for women in leadership to, to remember that they need to be fed too. So to take, you know, they're oftentimes they're the ones creating the experiences for everybody else. So they're creating the conferences and the retreats and all the events, but to actually make sure that they're taking some time to go to some 
where yeah. they can actually meet other like-minded people and to right. go there with an open spirit, you know, uh, without the spirit of competition and comparing and all those things that got to hit our heads as leaders sometimes, yes. but to go there with an open spirit, to try to, to see if there's someone that you just really click with. Yeah. Yeah. The other thing I loved about what you shared is you said that it was that one person who just took that risk and said, I can't do this without you, without the other two of you. And um, I think with vulnerability, so many times it's, it's scary. It's scary to step out and say something like that, because what if the other people (laughs) don't feel the same or, you know what I mean? And so do you have any tips on like practicing that vulnerability? Because I think a lot of women, again, in these leadership roles sometimes don't know how to start and step out in that vulnerability. Well, I think honestly, it, it really comes from practice. It does come from practicing. Yeah. Um, the, the woman who stepped out, she was someone who was in ministry, who was leading um, people who had gone through drug addiction. That's something she'd gone through the process of, you know, so she was very familiar with sharing her truth, even ugly parts of her truth. Mm. As the other two of us had come, had come into the situation kind of with professions and, and one was in full-time ministry, similar to the women you're describing who mm-hmm. may be in full-time ministry and have never had that liberty to just be that open. And yeah. I came from medicine where you don't share your emotions. That's mm-hmm. just not done. So uh, for, it, it helped me to see someone else do it. And so I think sometimes you, um, what I had done, and I know the other two women, as we talked about it, had done, we all came there praying for God to help us find those people <laughs> to yeah. help to help connect us to someone. Mm. And I think that's important to to come there, like I said, with an open kind of mind on God, I, I don't know how to do this. I don't know how to even connect with the right person. I'm going to put my, I'm going to take a risk. I'm going to take up this leap of faith. I'm going to go to this conference, try, you know, be spirit led. I, I find sometimes because this particular conference that I went to, it was one of those situations where I knew I would know no one. Mm. nobody I knew was writing books. So I knew I would know not a single person there. And I think it's good to be in those situations, to put yourself in those uncomfortable situations, because the the tendency is I'm going to go to this conference and I'm going to take a girlfriend who is someone I already can't really open up with because really I'm leading her too, but I'm going to take this girlfriend (laughs) with me because I don't want to be alone or I'm going to bring my husband or I'm going to take somebody because I still want my comfort zone, even though I'm asking God to do something new. And so I think there's got to be a little bit of a a leap of faith that God, I'm going to put myself in this uncomfortable situation of being by myself with just you to like to lead me. And I'm going to ask you to lead me to the right people that you want in my life in this season. Mm. Yeah. I love that. I've, I've experienced that same just the blessing of going into a situation completely knowing no one and coming out with with friends. So mm-hmm. it's beautiful. All right, let's talk a little bit about the other the other uh, rest that I would love to talk a little bit more about is the sensory one that you mentioned because I know for me, I am someone who doesn't like to turn off the noise. I like to have a podcast going or a TV show going or you know, there's always something unless I'm like working. If I'm working head down working, I can't I can't have the noise. But other than that. Uh, I tend to have things on. But like you said, sometimes I have to make the intentional choice of when I'm driving, just turning everything off and just allowing it to be silent. Um, But, you know, I would love to hear more about this and how, what are, again, some practical ways that women who maybe are feeling that sensory overload or how can they recognize the sensory overload? Like, are there signs of that? Because that's maybe people don't even realize that it's happening. (laughs) Well, I, I, one of the main things is if you have a tendency to be easily agitated and you don't know why, uh, for example, you get home from work and your teen says, what's for dinner? And you snap his head straight off. Chances are you've got something <laughs> going on because they just want to eat. They're not trying to be offensive. You know, yeah. <laughs> they're just hungry. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, you know, when you're easily agitated and it, and you can't pinpoint it. It's Mm. not like someone got on your nerves that day or anything that you can pinpoint. You just are always kind of on edge. 
then something's keeping you on edge. And for many people, that is a, sen- a, a underlying sensory overload. And and honestly, one of the biggest sensory overloads right now are people's uh, gadgets, is their cell phones. Uh, some of the studies that I looked at showed that you know for doctors we carry a we for years now it's a cell phone, but for years we carried pagers. Right. And so, you know, when the pager goes off, my heart rate would go up, my breathing would change. I would basically go into that fight or flight response because I knew something bad was probably going on yeah. if they're paging me. And so now what they're seeing is that the normal Americans having the very same response with every time their phone sends them a notification. It's like, what wow. is it? You know, who, who needs me? What's going on? And some of those notifications are just letting you know that Susie had a latte and it's great. You know? <laughs> And so the problem is when all of our social media and all of our text messaging and, you know, all of these different things are coming through on our notifications and, you know, every five minutes it's ding and buzz and vibrate, then you're keeping your body in a level of of cortisol overactivation, which is really what that sensory overload leads to. And, and that, that's a problem for a lot of us. Yeah. 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 One of the best things I have ever done is basically turn off all the notifications on my phone. Yeah. (laughs) I only get notifications (laughs) for like two apps because I was feeling that I was, I would sit down to work and I would start typing. I would start working on a client project and then I would hear the ding and it would, you know, it would totally throw me off and distract me. And then, oh no, I got to check that. So yeah, having that turned off is, it's a game changer. (laughs) And just using it for like the, 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 the things that are really important. For example, you know, I had one, because when you tell people to do this, who have been living under that, that chronic kind of uh, attached to your cell phone notification yeah. thing, it's the, it's a little bit of weaning process that has to happen because honestly, it's almost like they'll go into withdrawal from yeah. pulling away from that. So I, I always come with this caveat because because on, withdrawal is a real thing, even with your electronics to, to, to go slowly. You know, if you've had, Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and everybody notifying you, then take away one a week, you know, until you're, you're getting to a point where it's just a couple of notifications you're getting. And they're really things you need to know. Your teen needs to be picked up or, you know, your, your kid had a fever, you know, something you really need to know and not everything that's happening in the world. Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, I thought about this in the past and I don't know if I wrote a blog post about it or not, but you know, the kind of the urgency mindset. It seems like we are in a phase of our life uh, now in our culture where everybody kind of has that urgency mindset that if somebody texts me, I have to text back right away. Yes. And if somebody, you know, tags me on Facebook, I have to go respond right away. Are there any recommendations you have on on how we can kind of get out of that urgency mindset or, or just lower that a little bit <laughs> so that well, we can experience the- that? Yes, I'm like that. So one of the huge things that has really helped me is to start practicing flow break cycles and to get into a habit of time blocking specific activities that tend to be more stressful to me. For example, emails, you know, we have emails. And if you're a person in leadership, you have emails coming all day long. So you could technically every 10 minutes, check your inbox and find something they are new to do. But the problem is that it's almost like checking your notifications on your phone. It gets very, you know, you start feeling antsy after doing that for a while. (laughs) So if you time block it, you can say that I'm going to check my email at from eight to 10 in the morning or whatever time you pick. And I'm going to check it again from three to five. And I'm going to answer whatever happens then. But anything that comes in between there, I'm going to block that time off to do deep work where I'm not, you know, attached to all this stuff. I'm going to work from 10 to 12 and do deep work, do, um, you know, 120 minutes of diving deep into whatever that activity I've got to do for the day. Take a break. So it's flowing and breaking. You flow in your mental, creative, intellectual, Mm -hmm. mental juices, and then you break. And the flow break cycle should be between 90 and 120 minutes for most people. Because to get deep into work, you got to sit there a minute and go deep. So you do the deep work and then you spend time getting up, walking around, stretching, getting some water since half the world's dehydrated, you know, doing, going outside if need be, maybe taking your meal outside if necessary. And then you go back into flow and then your next flow, maybe just 90 minutes. And and then you take a quick break, particularly in the evening time, people tend to get more drained quicker. 
Yeah. And so you take a quick break, maybe to just go walk around your yard for a few minutes, just to get 15 minutes of sunlight and, mm-hmm. and, you know, creative rest from being outside. Yeah. Then you may, at that time, it may be time to hit that, you know, email so that you can see yeah. what's going on and, and answer those. But to allow yourself to not have these kind of energy draining activities scattered throughout the day. So you're being depleted all day long, but you're purposely blocking them off in ways so that you can get them done. Then you can do something to revive yourself. Then you can go into your deep work and have this pattern of flowing and breaking so that you continuously are reviving yourself and restoring your energy throughout the day. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. I think it's, it's something that we, a lot of us struggle with. And I think if we could kind of train ourselves differently, it would, it would transform a lot of our lives. So Mm -hmm. thanks for that practical tip. All right. So I have one more question specifically about rest because you mentioned the creative rest and you mentioned that it's really not, you know, us creating something, but more being, being inspired and being filled up by other things by beauty. Uh, and I'm just curious about that because for me, for example, I love writing and mm-hmm. writing is something that when I do it, I feel good. Like I feel re- refueled if it's not, if it's not writing for the sake of work purposes, but just free writing. Mm-hmm. So is, the, but you said there's kind of a difference between, you know, the writing that you do f- for work versus this inspirational kind of being filled up. But what would you say to someone who loves creating art? You know, they, they're an artist and they love sitting there and painting, for example. Um, Would you say that's not rest for them? That's not rest because they're working, but so the actual, you know, writing and the actual painting is work. You're doing work, but this is the thing. Most writers and most artists are expressing their emotions on into their work. Okay. So they're actually getting emotional rest while doing creative work. Okay. Okay. And so I find a lot of writers, bloggers, they can emotional, they can share their truth more authentically in a creative form. Yep. So that's how they're getting that emotional rest. They're not speaking it to a person. They are pouring it out on a page or they are pouring it out on a canvas but they're doing work because they've got to, you know, grammar check and they're, yeah, <laughs> they're right. putting words together and they're intellectually thinking it through, okay. but they're actually getting emotional rest during that time because they're sharing their truth. They're being authentic in the process. Got it. Okay. So that kind of leads me to my last question about this whole this whole conversation about rest is that, you know, you were mentioning, for example, your long distance relationships with these two other women that kind of fills up. It sounds like it fills up emotional and social for mm-hmm. you. So that was kind of my question was like, uh, it sounds like there's certain activities that we might be able to do where we can experience more than one type of rest. Because for me, thinking, oh my word, I have to get seven different types of rest. Like (laughs) like that feels overwhelming. (laughs) It shouldn't because that's the thing. Many of us were already doing it. We just haven't labeled it. And because we haven't labeled it, when we get depleted, we don't know what we need to fix. Right. It, it is. It does all work together. Let me give you an example. One of my favorite things to do is to go for a leisure walk. I call them a prayer walk. So I'm getting the physical rest in that I'm not trying to get my Fitbit steps up. I'm just trying to move my body some and yeah. loosen up my shoulders and my neck and my legs. Mm-hmm. So I'm getting the leisure walk outside. So I'm enjoying the birds and the flowers and the beauty of nature. I'm talking to God at during the time. So I'm building up that spiritual relationship. I'm getting three types of rest and I'm not sitting on my couch while I'm doing it. So I'm, I'm physically active. So, you know, when most of us think rest, we think cessation. Yeah. That's not cessation. I'm physically doing something the entire time but I'm being restored. And that's the key is rest should equal restoration. And when you approach it that way, you start thinking. And so then you can start thinking what is being restored? Because like your example, I'm sitting down and I'm writing out something and I leave that spot feeling better than how I entered in. So, you know, something was restored. Yeah. Then the point is what, what did I restore? Because I wasn't being poured into by beauty necessarily. I was pouring, I was allowing myself to experience rest within the writing. Or I'm outside at the beach and I just feel better. What what got restored? Mm. What was poured into me that made me feel better when I left that moment? 
Yeah. So my next question was going to be, how can leaders <clears throat> determine which area of rest they should focus on? And it sounds like part of this is just that self-awareness of asking yourself that question after you yeah. do something, what, what, you know, what area did I feel restoration in? Absolutely. That's a huge part of it. And and many people do struggle with that. And I think that is why ultimately I came up with rest quiz. So okay. I send a lot of people to restquiz.com to kind of get a quick assessment of how, you know, exactly what is my area of rest deficit so that they can focus their attention on getting rest in that specific area and not trying to worry about, oh, I got to get all seven. No, chances are you're already excelling at some of the seven. And there's a few that you don't even know you need because you really hadn't thought about it yet. Mm -hmm. And so just identifying it helps you to be more aware. And then you can kind of determine different ways because it looks different for every person. You know, I think it's interesting when I get emails from women that's like, I told my husband he needs to rest and he went outside and started chopping wood. And I'm like, okay, did he come back in feeling better? Yeah, but how is that possible? <laughs> you know, he chopped wood for three hours. You know, for yeah. men, a lot of them get rest doing repetitive activities yeah. because their head space, their mental space can go to a, a quiet spot. They're not having to think about the activity because it's repetitive. Yeah. Fishing chopping, things like that, where you're not having to stay mentally engaged, running, you're not having to stay mentally engaged in your head can get to that quiet place. And that's what they're needing most is that mental rest. So it doesn't look the same for every person. And you have to let people kind of, you you can't judge somebody else's rest. You have to let them experience it and, and, you know, figure it out for themselves. Same with kids. Same with teens. If you've got a child who, you know, is video game happy and they play video games for 10 hours a day and you notice that at the end of the day, they're anxious and or even grumpy. That's what most people find. They're they're irritable. They're upset and they're yelling at the screen and they started off happy. And now it's like their anger, their anger issues are popping out. That's a social rest deficit, a a sensory. I'm sorry, sensory sensory, rest deficit. They've become sensory overloaded. Yeah. So you may have to put the limit on that and say, you know what? 10 hours is a lot of games. Let's, <laughs> let's cut that back a little bit. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, goodness. I love that you pointed out that it's different for everyone. Uh, that's that's really something that I have um, felt for a long time just in talking about just wellness in general. I've done a few episodes about wellness and about how, you know, the way that we fill ourselves up, fill up our cup. And I haven't gone into these seven areas of rest. So I'm excited about that. I'm excited about the rest quiz that you mentioned. So people can check that out and find out where they need to focus. So um, we love to wrap up our conversation with leaders are learners. We really believe that leaders are constantly learning. And I love you've given us so much to, to learn about rest and to just shift our mindset around this concept of rest for ourselves. But I'd love to know from you, is there something that you've been learning lately, uh, a particular book or a podcast or anything that God's been teaching you that you would want to share with our audience? Well, the the thing I think that particularly in this season, you know, with COVID-19 and everything yeah. that's going on with that, I, I think the thing that I've been kind of sitting in and meditating in more than, than, anything else is just learning how to adjust to change. You know, change management is not something that I had spent a lot of time thinking about um, and really hadn't incorporated it in the whole concept of how we, what type of rest we need when change happens, Mm, (laughs) crisis happens. And I'm seeing, I'm just seeing the effects of that, you know, on people and how it's affecting their lives. So, so currently that's kind of been an area that I've been researching more and looking at more because it's affecting people greatly. You know, there's recent that I'm a nerd, so I'm going to quote a study to you. There's a study that came out um, March, 2020 from sleep standard, you know, that was saying that over 75% of of Americans um, say that their sleep have changed. Their sleep habits have changed since March of this year. And um, about 50% of them were saying that they feel more anxious throughout the day, you know, and that's surprising, um, you know, because what it shows is that we really didn't have kind of a, kind of a, 
a reservoir of how to adjust to change when it occurs in our lives. None of us had ever really had to deal with that. We like to keep things under a certain level of control. Mm -hmm. And so um, that's a new area for me, really kind of seeing how to help people with that. Okay. Yeah. So interesting. I I can completely relate to that because I (laughs) just say, just in the Facebook group the other day, somebody said, has anybody else just been like, their sleep schedule completely thrown off during this whole season. And it's, yes, I can vouch for that myself. (laughs) So, (laughs) all right. Well, thank you so much for everything you've shared today, Dr. Sandra. I really appreciate. um, And I'm excited to check out more of your book. And I would love for you to just wrap us up with sharing, where can people find you? Where would you love to direct them? You know, if they want to dive in deeper into this whole concept of rest, where can they go? Yes. Well, the name of the book is Sacred Rest, Recover Your Life, Renew Your Energy, Restore Your Sanity. And it's available wherever books are sold, Amazon, Barnes and Nobles, Lifeway. You you pick your retailer. Yep. And my main website is I choose my best life.com. Okay. Great. So I recommend everyone go over there, check it out, buy the book. We'll have the links for all of this in the show notes as well. So you can just click right there and and get the details for Dr. Sandra's book and her her social media, et cetera. So thank you again for joining us today. Oh, it's been my pleasure. Thank you. Hi friend. Thanks so much for listening to this episode of the Christian Woman Leadership Podcast. We're so glad you took the time out of your day to listen. And I truly hope that it made an impact on your ability to lead well. If it did, would you consider sharing this episode with a friend? You could take a screenshot of the episode and share it on your social media, maybe an Instagram story or on Facebook, or you could just text the link to a friend. We would truly appreciate that as when you share with a friend, it helps spread the word about the podcast and it helps more women to be able to be impacted so that they can lead and love others well. Now, don't forget your leadership matters and it's time for you to embrace your gifts and lead with confidence.